Okay, well, this is the third time with the study guide because I paused at some point, didn't hit record, so I don't know how far or where I left off. So I'm going to talk really fast. If you have a question, YouTube has the ability to slow things down so you can change the speed if you need to. Okay? So first one, y equals 3 times 1.9 to the x. It is the equation y equals a times b to the x. We talked about this number being the growth, which means the equation does this, and that's your y-intercept. So B is knocked out because it doesn't grow. D is knocked out because it's negative and there's no negative in my problem. This is my y-intercept. This has a y-intercept of 3 and that one does not. Now, I did put all of these in the calculator so you could see that's what it looks like and you have to compare that to what is on your calculator according to the scale. Okay? Number two, again, same problem y equals a times b to the x. The initial population is right here. Your annual rate is 0.23 and we just talked about if it's growth this number has to be larger than 1 so it's 1.23. That's why these two are crossed out. They don't have a growth rate. This one has a growth rate of um, a really really large number 130 percent or more than that. That's not even right. But anyway the point of it is a has to be the answer because that is 1 plus the growth rate of 23%. Okay, our function y equals 1 fifth 3, time, 3 to the x. Growth, it's larger than 1, so I know my function is going to do that. It has a y-intercept of 1 fifth, so I'm looking. It's got to have growth. That does not have growth. That does not have growth. This does, and I'm looking at the y-intercept next, and that is not 1 fifth, and this is. And again, if you look at it on your calculator, that's what it looks like, and so you can match it to your graph. Number four, one eighth is decay, so it's going to look something like this when it's falling, and the negative flips it over the x-axis. So if I took this and flip it over the x-axis, this is a possibility, that is not, and this is growth, and that is decay, but there's a negative sign in our problem. So that leaves A to be the only answer. Number five, um, I have one-fourth is decay. So again, it's going to be falling. That's not falling. This is falling, but it's, uh, it, it's negative. It's actually not falling. It's rising. But it's not negative, so that one can't be an answer. This is falling, and this is falling. But again, this is one that's been flipped over the x-axis as a negative. Um, we still have a y-intercept, a y-asymptote of y equals 2. But your, um, the decay, this is the only one that's decay, so your answer is going to be D. Let's see if I have that one. Is that, oh, I skipped that one for the last one, but that's the last one. And then 1.4, that's the one we're looking at right now. So again, you can check yourself with your calculator and know which one's the right answer. Okay, this one, asymptote of y equals 0, and it moves to the left, and it is decay. Asymptote, not y equals 0, not y equals 0, not y equals 0. The answer had to be D. But again, we'll put it in so you can see. That's what it looks like, and that matches basically to what we have on our graph. Again, asymptote is y equals 1. Looks like both of these have y equal 1. Um, neither of those have y equals 1. That's why they've been crossed out. Those asymptotes look like y equals negative 1. So come back down. y equals 1 and it's growth because that's larger than 1. So this is growth and this is not growth. So the answer has to be A. Number 8. Um, compounded continuously is our PERT formula. And so when you plug in 1600 and 4.6 written as a decimal is 0 0.046 times 4. You're raising that to the e power. When you put it in your calculator, you should get an answer of D. C was a little more challenging because they wanted you to go figure out what that R was, but I'm pointing out to you here, part A, there's no T in the formula. It's going to be this same formula, so there's no T up there, so that one's out. There's a plus sign here. There's no plus sign in our formula, so that one is out. And here, if you look at the interest rates, this is an interest rate of of 1.8 and this is an interest rate of 180. Yeah, not happening. So the answer has to be C, but you can put in 1 for T and you would get this number in that formula and that's another way to check that you've got the right answer. 
evaluating logarithms, log base 3 of 243. You need to rewrite 243 as a base of 3, which is where we get this expression. And we talked about it, it's the exponents over each other. If you don't remember that, you can use your change of base rule, which says the log of 243 divided by the log of 3, and the answer is 5. Write the equation in logarithmic form. you got to know this definition. Okay, log base b of x to the y, that's our little kick out, and so b to the y equals x. That being the case, if you do that for each of these problems, 10 to the 5th is 32, 5 squared is 32, 2 to the 5th is, well that's the right one. But I wanted you to see if you know that kick out, how obvious it is to find the right answer. Okay, same thing for this one. Starting with the base, the base raised to that is equal to that, which is where we get an answer of A. Number 13, talked about the log function. Our log general shape of the log is this, asymptote is x equals 0. These were the key points, the negative 1, 0, 1 on the y, and the 3 is your B. So this would be 3, and that would be 1 third. And when you put it in, okay, this is the only one that has that shape. So the answer is C. However, if you felt strongly about putting it in your calculator, you would, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't show you that one. Um, you would have to put it in. This right here you get by hitting Control and then the division symbol. That gives you a little fraction bar. It's the log of x divided by the log of 3. So that's how you graph things that aren't base 10 in your base 10 calculator. So this was the only one that looked like it, and that is the answer. Okay, look at 14. Again, it's been moved down 7 and left 1. So my asymptote is x equals negative 1, which both of these have. But I'm going to look at the other two, and they are not the log function. They do not have vertical asymptotes. So going back, this graph has been shifted up, and this graph has been shifted down. Um, again, you can check it on your calculator, and when you put it in, um, if you can't see it because it was down here, then you can drag it around with your mouse pad and um, figure out where it is, which is the advantage of having the Inspire. 15. Write as, an, um, as a single logarithm. If it's a power in front, it becomes the exponent. That's our power rule. And if you're adding logs, we bring it together with multiplication, which is why this is the answer. Okay? This way you're going backwards. It's multiplication, it's going to become addition, and therefore this is the only one with addition, and that has to be your answer. So if you know that rule, then you're good to go. Okay, and this is where I had my technical problem, so I'm starting over again. This, using your change of base, log of 91, divided by the log of 3, and if you put that in your calculator, you will find out that the answer is 4.106. Um, again, you can use the change of base rule, but I'm going to show you it's the log of 3 to the 4th, log base 3 to the 4th of 3 to the 1. So we need to know the answer is 1 over 4. Again, if you use your change of base rule, it would be the log of 3 divided by the log of 81. Alright, solve the exponential equation. So when you're doing this, okay, how do you solve it? We write them in the same base. So that's 2 squared to the 4x equals 2 to the third, okay, which becomes 2, when you raise a power to a power, that's 2 to the 8x equals 2 to the third. And if my bases are the same, I can get rid of them and set my exponents equal to each other, which you can see the answer is going to be x equals 3 eighths. Now, you can also take this to the other side and use the zero method on your calculator that we have talked many times about. Or you could take each of these numbers and plug it into that equation and see which one equals 8. So multiple ways, but again, if you don't know the shortest, most efficient way, you might not finish your exam on time. You do not have to use a table to solve this. Um, I am going to do it out mathematically because that's the point of our exam. So I cannot write these both in the same power, same base, excuse me. Um, again, you can use the zero method just like I told you about here. But 
um, you would have to take the log of both sides. I take the natural log just because it's easier to write. So the natural log of that is the natural log of 63. So 4x times the natural log of 6 equals the natural log of 63. And then we talked about how we're multiplying everything, so I'm going to divide. And that leaves me with x equal ln of 63 divided by 4 times ln of 6. Okay, you have to be careful when you do this. Um, depending on your calculator, you might need to put parentheses around the numerator and the denominator. So this would be something worthwhile for you to check and make sure that when you put that in your calculator, you get the answer of 0.58, because if not, you don't know how to put things in your calculator correctly. Okay, if you have a um, horizontal fraction bar, which is what I've told you about most of the year, that's the easiest way to make sure you put it in correctly. Okay, 21. Again, um, solvent, I have to use the definition, the kick out. So 10 raised to the third is going to be that number. So 10 to the third equals that expression, not number. 10 to the third is 1,000, and 1,000 minus 10 is 990. And 990 divided by 4 is B. All right, same kind of thing, except for I don't just have a single log, so I have to bring these two together. And they come together by being the log of 5x times 14. So that means 10 to the 1 equals that. So we have 70x equals 10 to the 1st, and x equals 10 over 70, which is 1 over 7, which is 0.14. Um, again, bringing things back together, this is the power. So um, that's, and then this is going to become multiplication. So I'm going to be multiplying these two things. Um, 3 to the third is not 9, and I needed C to the third. So the answer is D. 24, again, that becomes that. This, when you distribute it, is going to be minus ln one half, remember when that becomes a power, okay, that it's like the square root of b. So that's minus the ln of the square root of b minus the ln of the square root of c squared, okay. So a cubed is on the top, knocks that out and that out, and these two, ln of square root of b is not going away, so that means that's not possible, and of course the square root of c squared is c. So our answer is d. Okay, use natural logarithms. Again, we're at this problem where um, you can bring this over and set it equal to zero, plug it into your crafting calculator, or you can plug in each of these. But again, might not finish. Um, but first off, if I'm going to solve it by hand, I'm going to take the 2 to the other side. 3 plus 2 is 5. Then I'm going to divide by 6. And e to the 4x, I'm going to take the ln of both sides here. So the ln of e to the 4x equals 4x, and that's the ln of 5, 6. So x equals the ln of 5, 6 over 4. Again, worthwhile making sure you know how to put it in your calculator. The answer that you should get is d, negative uh, 0.046. Okay, so we're back to some graphs, and these are our, um, that's our main function. Our parent function that we talked about is y equals 1 over x, and that looked like this. And we had the key point of 1, 1, and we had the key point of, of negative 1, negative 1. And most of you all know that 4 changed this point, and now we had the point 1, 4. But regardless, it does knock out A, and it knocks out, oh, wow, it knocks out D, okay? Um, but it might be B, and it might be, oh, go away. Oh, what is it, B or C? Except for C matches it, and if it has the point 1, 4, and 4, 1, that other graph actually was going here and here, which is what you get when you have a negative. So the answer here is C. That's the one that's negative, negative. 
in the interest of time, I'm not going to show any more graphs unless I absolutely have to. This problem, you need to solve it for y. So xy equals negative 3 and y equals negative 3 over x. So that's just like what we talked about where this is the parent function, but if it's negative, it's going to be here and here. So that knocks off A. Let's see if B and C. Oh, well, hello. Can't be lines, so my answer has got to be C. But again, 1, 3, and then 3, 1 in those negative quadrants. So we're good. Uh, I didn't get the equation. 28. Okay, so what does 28 do? Okay. So if you're looking at 28, this is your y asymptote. y equals negative 3. This is my vertical asymptote. x equals negative 2 and negative 4. Um, again, we said it's normally here and here. Uh, get rid of that. Okay, it's normally these two quadrants. Because of that negative, it would be here. So I'm looking for y equals negative 3 and x equals negative 2. y equals negative 3. That's not negative 3. That's negative 3. That's not negative 3. That's negative 3. And then I need it x equals negative 2. So my answer has to be c, just according to the asymptotes. Okay, so 29. Mm. Write an equation. Okay, so we kind of just talked about that, where your asymptotes are. Um, let's go with um, x equals 7 is going to go in the bottom. That knocks out those two right there. And if x equals 7, if you can't remember, um, this one says x equals 7. This one says x equals negative 7. So x equals 7, my answer has to be C for number 29. Okay, number 30. We have <clears throat> horizontal asymptote. That is Betsy Bobo Botu. You're looking at the highest number on the top and the bottom. That's the degree of your polynomial. And it is bigger on top, and that's Botu. And the U is undefined, which means we have no horizontal asymptote. Number 31. Okay, what is the equation for the function? This is my asymptote. That says x equals negative 4, which means on the bottom I should have x plus 4, and that knocks out these two. And what's the difference here is, is this is a y asymptote of negative 3, and this is positive 3, and my function is at positive 3, so my answer to 31 is going to be d. Okay, 32. Find any points of discontinuity. Discontinuity is um, where that denominator is equal to zero. What makes this denominator zero is the opposite. What makes that zero is negative one and negative four. So your answer is B. What makes this one zero? I don't know unless I factor and it becomes X minus seven, X minus two. And that is x equals 7 or x equals 2. And so my answer is D. Describe the vertical asymptotes. We just talked about that. That's where I get factors. So I got x plus 2, x plus 4. And that is x equals negative 2 and negative 4. And a whole is where you have a factor that cancels. And I don't have a factor that cancels. So I have no holes, which knocks out these two. And that says asymptote is 1, and this is negative 4 and negative 2. So 34 is D. 35, horizontal asymptote. Again, I'm looking at the degree, the highest exponent on the top and the bottom. And I have bottom equals top. So that's Betsy. And the C stands for the coefficients. So I'm looking at Y equals negative 2 over 2, which is Y equals negative 1. Uh, sorry about that. And you know what time it is. 36. Simplify state any restrictions. So I'm going to have to factor these. The top is k minus 2, k plus 1. The bottom is k, and that is not a k, 
the bottom is k minus 5 and k plus 1. So those two cancel, leaving me with k minus 2 over k minus 5. So those are gone. And what's the difference in this is those restrictions. And this is negative 1. They both have negative 1, and that's positive 5. So your answer is going to be D. Um, what is the graph of this? Now, what we did on the problem was to do long division. But you can do Betsy Bobo Botu. The degree of the top is 1. The degree of the bottom is 1. So this is bottom equals top. And I didn't get that right. Bottom equals top is Betsy. So it's the coefficient. So it's y equals 2 is my horizontal asymptote. Well, that knocks that guy out and knocks this one out. Is that y equals 2? Is that 2? 1, 2, 3? That's 2, and that's not 2. So that's all you really needed to know. If you need more than that, the other easy one thing to figure out is x equals negative 1 is your vertical asymptote, and that does have a vertical asymptote of x equals negative 1. Okay, 38. Um, need to factor both the top and the bottom to see x minus 3 on top, x plus, no, x minus 3, x minus 1 on the bottom is x minus 3 and x plus 3. So if this cancels, that means that I have a hole at x equals 3. So I'm going to go look at the graphs real quick and see which one has a hole at x equals 3. Do they all have holes at x equals 3? Let's go see. 3, 3, 3. They do all have a hole. Great. So let's go back and um, this tells me that I have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 3 and a horizontal asymptote. You can look at it here or here, but this is bottom equals top, Betsy. So it's y equals 1 because it's 1 over 1. So I'm going to go look for those two asymptotes. x equals negative 3. Yes, yes, yes. I'm oh, great. And what did we have? We had y was equal to um, 1. I think we did. Did we have y equals 1? Yes, we had y equals 1. So that's not y equals 1. So cross that out. Um, what else? Uh, y equals 1. Um, does C have y equals 1? It does. D, B doesn't have y equals 1, and that does not have y equals 1. So my answer has to be C. So I was able to do it by just knowing how to find my asymptotes and knowing where the holes were. Okay, uh, 39. Product state in these restrictions. So I'm looking at the numbers first. I have a 3 on top and two tens on bottom, and none of those cancel. So that leaves that one out of the picture. <clears throat> then I'm looking at my variables. I have a G on the top and the bottom, and I have more on the top. So I'm going to end up with G on the top, and I have three more Gs. And if you look at them, that knocks out these two. Um, if you don't feel comfortable with that, go ahead and do the H's and find out that I have more H's on top, and again, I have three of those. But again, just trying to get you to get through quickly if you need to. Oh, restrictions, but again, H and G, <clears throat> excuse me, are on the bottom, so they both can't be zero. Okay, on number 40, <coughs> excuse me, you need to factor these. So this gives me Y minus 3 and Y plus 2 over y times y plus 1. So I'm going to cross this out so I don't get confused. But I have a y minus 3 and a y minus 3. I'm left with y plus 2 over y plus 1, but I have, I guess some people messed up because they tried to cancel right here, and you can't do that because that's not a factor. This is the factor. So I have 1 on the bottom and 2 on top, which leaves me with 1 on the bottom. So that knocks out these two. And anything that makes the bottom 0 is a restriction. And so that's 3, that one is 0, and that one is negative 1. So my answer to 40 is B. All right, so 41. <clears throat> Same kind of thing. 
But this is division, and so I have to um, keep change flip. So I'm going to multiply, and when I change it, I'm going to go ahead and factor. So that's a plus 1, and on the top, a minus 5 times a minus 3. And then I'm going to cross that out so I don't get confused. Um, the only thing that cancels is a minus 5. So I'm left with a plus 2 and a minus 3 on the top. That knocks out these two. And now the difference is the restrictions. Um, this one has a 5. Is 5 a restriction? Well, absolutely it is right there. So the answer to 41 has to be A. Find the least common multiple. You have to factor to do that. This is going to be X minus 6, X minus 1. <clears throat> this is going to be X um, plus 4, X minus 1. So how many different ones? I need an x minus 6, I need an x minus 1, and I need an x plus 4. And that, of course, is in A. Simplify the sum. Um, to simplify, I'm going to factor that first one. So that first one's going to come over here, and it's going to be um, on the bottom, I'm going to have A plus 5A minus 3. And on the top is a plus 5a plus 2. Well, these two cancel. <clears throat> so I just have to add a plus 2 plus 10 because now I have the same denominator. And a plus 2 plus 10 is a plus 12 over that. So we're good to go. 44. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to take this one. Uh, it's hard to do there, but... I'll just go here and do it. So this is n minus 6, n minus 4, over n minus 6, n minus 7. So these go away. Subtracting 9 over n minus 7, n minus 4 minus 9 is n minus 13. And that looks good, but I don't get to lose the denominator, so it's got to be a. 44 is a. I don't know why they would think we would lose the denominator on that. I guess some people think it just cancels, but it doesn't. Okay, 45. Yeah, tough for a lot of people. Those cancel, so that's that. These cancel, leaving me. So I have 1 over b minus 1 over 2b, 2 over 3b plus 4 over b. And what I told you to do was to multiply the top and bottom by the LCD. And the least common denominator of 2b, b, 3b, and b is 6b. 6 is the smallest number that 2 and 3 go into and they all have a b in them. So some people find it easier if you multiply each of these 6b over 1, 6b. That's the same thing. You're multiplying the top and bottom. You're multiplying every term by the same thing so it doesn't change the value of your fraction. But what does this give you? The b's cancel leaving you with 6. 2b goes into 6b three times, 3b goes into 6b two times, and 2 times 2 is 4. I didn't have to worry about it here because I had a 1 up top. And b goes into 6b six times. So 6 minus 3 is 3, 4 plus 6 is 10, so your answer is d. 46, okay? <clears throat> if you do this and think about what it can't be first, <clears throat> this right here tells you that A cannot be 6 or negative 6, which knocks out all of these answers. So your answer is A. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, your LCD is A squared minus 36, which is A minus 6. Oh, I'll just write A plus 6, A minus 6. And you have to do this times each term. So um, a minus 6 times a plus 6 is a squared minus 36, so that cancels leaving me with just a plus a minus 6 cancels with a minus 6, so I'm left with 2 times a plus 6. And a plus 6 cancels leaving me with just 1. So I'm left with a plus 2a plus 12 equals, oh, my bad. It's not 1 right there, y'all. I'm so sorry. The a plus 6 is cancel, leaving me with a minus 6 times 1. So that's a minus 6. 
So I have 3a plus 12 equals a minus 6. Subtract a, subtract 12, and a equals negative 9. So we're good to go. 47. Again, I'm going to multiply. The only thing a can't be is 0, not one of my choices. So I'm going to multiply by 3a. Okay, so I'm going to go through this same thing that we did. The a's cancel, leaving me with 4 times 3. The 3a's three cancel, leaving me with just 5. And there's no denominator, so I have to multiply those two together. So 17 equals 9a, and a equals 17 over 9, which is what? 47. I mean, the answer to a, 47. Okay, 48. Um, a mirror. Okay, we're into conic sections now. Okay, um, when you read that problem, assume that the parabola opens a upward, which is enough to knock out those two right there. Okay, your vertex is right here, which is at the origin, because when we did these, a word problem, um, that's the easiest place to put it. Your pipe is two inches above it. That's two. And this you should be able to figure out is that focus and this tells me that 2 is C because that's the distance from the focus to the vertex so y equals 1 over 4 C times x squared means my answer has to be C give the vertex focus directrix of the conic section okay so we have to complete the square x squared plus 8x plus blank equals, and I'm going to take the other things to the other side, 12y, I need to move this guy, hold on, he's in my way, come here, right here, move, go over there, okay, um, y, x, 12y minus 64 plus blank, half of 8 is 4, 4 squared is 16. So this gives me x plus 4 quantity squared equals 12y minus 48. Okay? Um, to find the vertex, if you factor out this 12, this is x plus 4 quantity squared equals 12 times y minus 4. So that makes my vertex, h is always with x, K is always with Y. And the only one that has that vertex is C. So you don't need to worry about the other stuff. Equation of the parabola with that vertex. Uh, I'm going to plot this information. 5, 4. This is 4. This is 5. That's my vertex. 8, 4. This is my focus. That means that my parabola has to open like this, which means it's x equals something, and actually it's x minus h, that's not the way we write it, we write it x equals 1 over 4c times y minus k squared plus h. <clears throat> so what is my vertex? My vertex was 5, 8, or was it 4? Oh my bad, it is 4, I was looking at the problem before. Okay, so it's 5, 4. So which one says y minus 4 plus 5? Well, the only one that does is A. So I'm not going to worry about anything else. Um, again, I'm going to plot this information. Negative 2, 5. Um, I probably should do that. Let's go again. Let's put it down here. Negative 2, 5 is my vertex. Boom. 6 is my focus, boom, which means that my parabola has to go like this. That means it's y equals 1 over 4c times x minus h quantity squared plus k. <clears throat> what was my vertex? My vertex was 5, nope, negative 2, 5. So that's going to be x plus 2 plus 5. How many of those is it? x plus 2? That's not. That one's not, and that one's not, so my answer has to be D. So you didn't have to find the C, although it's not hard to find it. Okay, so 52, what are the domain and the range? Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with domain. 
Um, and somebody pointed out, Eddie, shout out to Eddie, pointed out that this is not a circle because these two are the same. So if it's a circle, cross them out. Okay, it's always a good idea to look at them. This one's a circle also. So we cross out um, A and D. So I'm going to go figure out which one's the domain, and we do by plugging in 0 for Y because it's, I'm talking about the possible X values. 4X squared equals 25 x squared equals 25 over 4, and x equals plus or minus 5 over 2, which is 2.5, which looks like that one, but if you want to check it, I'm going to go ahead and put that as the answer, so I don't have to come back. It says x is between plus or minus 2.5, and that one doesn't set it. It says it for the y, so we're good to go. All right, moving along. I hope I'm not going too fast for you. <clears throat> so, 53. Uh, write the equation of the translation of that three units to the left. Well, you should know by now three units to the left is going to be x plus 3, and four units up is going to be y minus 4. So which one's x plus 3, y minus 4? The answer is b. Radius doesn't change when you shift it up and down. What is the center and radius? There's my h. There's my k. This is r squared. So my center would be 4, 8. H is always with x. Y is always with k. So 4, 8 knocks out these two. This is the radius squared, so I have to take the square root of it, and 54 will be c. 55. I have to go complete the square, so I'm going to start up here so I don't run out of room. x squared plus 14x plus something uh, plus y squared minus 12y plus something equals, yeah, I'm running out of room, negative 69 plus something plus something. So half of 14 is 7 squared. Half of 12 is 6 squared. So that's going to give me x plus 7 squared plus y minus 6 squared equals 16. Center, negative 7, 6. Negative 7. <coughs> okay, so is my radius 16 or is my radius 4? It's the square root of that number, so my answer is going to be D. Uh, write an equation of an ellipse in standard form centered at the origin with the given characteristics. Okay, the vertex is always A, and this is your B. And if I'm moving left and right, then I know I have to have this number under the x. So under x has to be 9, which means the answer to 56 is A. 57. Again, A is um, the larger one, or the vertex. And the y is what's moving, so now A is under the y, and that's A. So y squared is 25, so the answer to 57 is C. <clears throat> Excuse me. I should have started with some water. 58. So 58 we have standard form centered at the origin. How far did I go left and right? I went 4. Um, so this is 4. And how far did I go up and down? But do this. Left and right is 4. So under the x has to be a 16. And the only one that has 16 under the x is a. You don't have to go any further. Moving along. Um, hyperbola. Hyperbola with a vertices at plus or minus 5, 0. If a vertex is here and here, x has to come first because it's doing this. So knocks that one and this one. And that's your a value. a is equal to 5 under the x. So again, x squared over 25. What are the foci? Okay, so this one may require a little bit of work, okay? Foci, but I did tell you this. Um, you're centered at the origin. If it's plus because it's an ellipse, then your equation is c squared equals a squared minus b squared. And this is a squared because a squared is always bigger than ellipse. So c squared equals 9 minus 4, which is 5. So we have plus or minus 5, the square root of 5. However, You've got to pay attention because uh, I think on the next page um, it has the 5, but this 
no, it has that same thing. So 0 plus or minus 5, but it does knock out B, and it knocks out A. Right, okay, so it knocks out A. So we have to figure out, um, <laughs> I didn't miss that mark, but you got the idea. Um, 0 plus, they both have that same foci, but I went up and down 3 and 2, so that one looks like it fits. Let's go see what's wrong with D. Um, I didn't go up and down 3. When the 9 was under the y squared. I mean, yeah, so that's I had to go up 3 on that. So we're good with the answer of C. So 61. Um, what is the standard form of ellipse? Sketch the equation. If we have these vertices, okay, um, halfway between those, um, my center, I want to find that center. Um, to find the halfway, it's going to be negative 1. And then I'm going to do 21 plus 5 over 2. That's your midpoint. That's halfway between. So that's 13. So my center is at negative 1, 13. Um, that looks like, oh, and that's not. It's negative 1. That's a negative y value. So those are knocked out. These two are both above. And A, how far did I move? Um, from 21 to 13 is 8, or 5 to 13 is 8. So I know that A equals 8, and it has to be under the Y. So which one has 64 under the Y between these two? They both do, but this, remember my center was 13. And so if that's my center, this is the one that has 13. So my answer has to be D. And this is one of those things I've said to you all along. When you're doing these, once you find the center, go write the top part. So we could have seen right away, this has a center of 1, negative 13. This one has negative 1, 13, which is what we needed. So our answer is D. And let's go to 62. All right, 62 says graph the conic section. Oops, excuse me. It says graph the conic and... What is 9 times 36? I would try that. I knew last time that it wasn't. Um, and 9 times 36 is 324. And since that is the case, then I'm going to go ahead and divide everything by 324. 324. Sorry, my writing is so bad. That means it's x squared over 36 minus y squared over 9 equals 1. Well, if the x squared is positive, it knocks out <coughs> the vertical. And I have to go left and right 6 units. And that looks like 6, and that's clearly not 6. So the answer has to be A. All right, 63, same kind of thing. Am I going to find out that 36 times 16 is 576? And it is. So I'm going to divide everything by... 576, 576, 576, which leaves me with y squared over 16 minus x squared over 36 equals 1. y squared is first, so I can knock out the um, any horizontal one, that one and that one. So this one underneath the y would be 16 if it's the correct answer. And let's go see if underneath the y is 16, and it is. And underneath this y is actually 6. So we know the answer is, I think that was letter B. Yep, we're good. Okay, so 63 is B. 64, um, what are the asymptotes of the equation? Okay, 9 times 4 is 36. So again, divide everything by 36 because that's y squared over 4 minus x squared over 9 equals 1. Um, I've told you the asymptotes are y equals plus or minus whatever's under the y over whatever's under the x. And of course, you take the square root of that. Um, it is also a vertical one. So if it's horizontal, um, I'm going to ignore it. So it's one of these two. Do they both have the same asymptotes? They don't. So it is clear that the answer to 64 should be D. All right, 65. 
Uh, there's hope I might get this done. All right, 65. Um, what are the center, foci, vertices, all that kind of junk? So my center for this equation, H is always with X, K is always with Y. So my center is 1, 4. That doesn't have a center of 1, 4. 1, 4, 1, and that one does not have a center of 1, 4. And then the difference here, um, this is, um, it's messing up. Uh, y is positive or first, so I know it has to be a vertical hyperbola. And so I'm not going to go find the rest of the information. Hope that didn't bother you. 66, what is, identify the conic section if it's parabola, blah, 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 you know, okay. So, um, I have to go complete the square. So, y squared plus 10y plus blank equals 4x minus 33 plus blank. Half of 10 is 5. Um, so, I add that to both sides. So, this gives me y plus 5 quantity squared equals 4x uh, minus 8. Oh, it's messing up on me, y'all. So this is H. Uh, actually, we need to factor that out first. So that's Y plus 5, because I don't want you to get confused. Factor out the 4, X minus 2. So H, K, my vertex is 2 comma negative 5. That looks good, and that's the answer. So 66 is D. Oh, I have to do it again here. Okay, so this one, when you look at these two right here, y'all, okay, Sorry, technology is messing with me. Um, it's an x squared minus a y squared, and you should knock out the ellipse immediately. Okay? So, um, and you should also be able to, if you look at these, the x coordinate is different, so I'm only going to worry about the x coordinate and completing the square. So I'm going to take out the 2. x squared, <clears throat> if I take 2 out of 20, I have 10, and then plus something. I got the rest of the problem. I take half of that number is 5 squared so that when I factor it, it's going to be 2 times x minus 5 quantity squared, which means that my center is at 5 and not negative 5. So 67 has to be B. On to probability. <clears throat> this is n times m ways, so it's 6 times 12, which is B. How many different orders? Okay, um, orders. Okay, so whether you want to know that that's 8 factorial or 8p8 8 8 on your calculator or drawing 8 blanks and putting 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times, all that kind of stuff. The answer is D. 70. 10 students in a spelling bee. Who goes first and who goes second? The order matters. So it is a permutation and you're choosing 10, excuse me, you're choosing 2 out of the 10, so that is 10p2, and 10p2 is the same thing as 10 times 9, and the answer to, oh my goodness, don't, don't fail on me now, um, 90. 71, you should put that in your calculator, and if you have any trouble, you should come see me, but the answer is D. How many ways can three singers? There is no distinguishing characteristics to that, so it is 5C3. Some people ask me today, um, the bigger number always goes first, y'all. 5C3 is 10, so your answer is B. 73. Um, a bag contains six red marbles, six white. The probability of red or blue. Okay, so um, how many red marbles do I have? I have six red marbles. I have four blue marbles. Remember, or is always about adding. Out of the total number of marbles that I have, which is 16. So 10 out of 16 becomes 5 out of 8. So your answer is C. Okay, 74. Theoretical probability of dealing exactly three fours. Okay, the bottom number is how many different possible hands do you have? You have a deck of cards, 52 cards in a deck. You're dealing five cards out. How many fours are there? There are four fours, and I want three of them. How many cards are not fours? 48. I want two of them. Again, punch that in your calculator, and you will get an answer of 94. 
out of 54145. If you need to, then you know convert it to a decimal to figure out which one is going to get you the right answer. Um, what is the probability that both balls are white? That's the probability of a white ball out of the first urn and a white ball out of the second urn, which means I'm going to multiply these, I mean, yeah, multiply, and is multiplication. So how many white balls are in the first urn? 9 out of 18, which if you want to say 1 half is absolutely fine. In the second one, I have 8 out of 11. So that, of course, is 1 half, and 2 goes into 8 four times, so it's 4 out of 11. And we're on to 76. <clears throat> okay, 76. Or, we just talked about is plus. Mutually exclusive, okay, means they can't both happen at the same time. The true formula for S or T is the probability of S plus the probability of T minus the probability of S or T. Uh -uh. Sorry, I went back to S and T. Well, the probability of S is 0.2, and the probability of T is 0.22, and the probability of S and T, you don't know, except for because you were told they were mutually exclusive. They cannot both happen at the same time, so it's zero, and we just add those two, and that gives us, what is it? Um, that's 42%, which is silly. It's having a little brain lapse there. Okay, what's the probability of an uppercase letter? Well, here's uppercase. There are five uppercase letters or a consonant, and then I have these consonants. So everything except for this is either uppercase or consonant, which means that's 9 out of 10, which is A. Joey's sock drawer. We've done this one. Um, so what's the probability that he will pull out a, what do I have, a brown or a dress sock? Brown or dress. So I'm going to go count. Is this, hey, hold on one second. Hold on one second. Okay, sorry about that. Had someone walk in. So we're looking for a brown or a dress sock. So that is brown or dress. This is not. This is brown or dress, and this is brown or dress, over a total of 22 socks. So you could do it that way. There's another way. If you want to know it that follows for me, you can um, come see me. I'll be happy to help you. But that's 13 plus 2 is 15 over 22, so your answer is A. All right, 79, um, contingency table. So this symbol right here means given, that bar. And what comes after it is our denominator. So the denominator is how many total in the sixth period class. <clears throat> and that total is 15. And when you have a given, you're only looking at those two numbers, which ones watched more than an hour, and that would be 9 out of 15. And that becomes the decimal of 0.6. So the answer is C. All right, each person. Um, okay, another frequency, two-way frequency table. All right, again, you need to find that keyword, and this keyword is or. So you're looking for afternoon or junior. So um, you got, so the total of afternoon classes. The total afternoon classes over here is going to be 48. <clears throat> the total of your juniors is 28. So according to our formula, it would be the probability of afternoon plus the probability of evening minus the probability, no, I'm sorry, it was the probability of afternoon plus the probability of a junior minus the probability of an afternoon and a junior over the total, which is 129. And when you divide that out, you get an answer of A. Okay, 81. Um, uh, this keyword is and, and when you're looking for this keyword, you're looking for the intersection of humanities and male, and that's the intersection of humanities and male. You have to add all those up to get the total, and the whole total number is 410. So 70 out of 410 gives you an answer of 1.171, so your answer is A. 
Um, this one, the probability the city bus is ready. You're f trying to, this is coming back to this formula. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of A <coughs> times the probability of B given that A happened. So if you're looking for a given, then you're going to divide these two numbers, okay? Because you're given an and, and you're given just one of them. So this problem is going to be 0.67 over 0.85, which the answer is D. Okay? Um, again, find the probability that a flight arrives on schedule given. Same concept, so it's going to be 71 over 90. And when you divide that, you're going to get an answer of 0.79. So your answer is B. Um, another two-way frequency table. This time we have given again. What comes after is my denominator. So how many females do I have? Uh, I think I have 112. And of those, which ones are wearing green? 29. So I have 29 out of 112. And that answer is C, 0.259. Okay, we're on to trig. Oh my goodness. Okay, on to trig. What's the period of the function? Um, I find it easiest to go from a max to a max. So what's the distance between 2 and 6? It is 4. So your answer is A. Find the amplitude and equation of the midline. Okay, so to find the amplitude, we've talked about that lots. That is the max minus the min divided by 2 and your max is 2, your min is negative 1, divided by 2, and that's 1.5, okay? There's only one that has that amplitude, and that is B. So we're going to go put down that the answer is B, okay? All right, moving on. Oopsie, yeah, 87, okay? Find the measure of the angle between 0 and 360 that is coterminal with 271. So, what you want to do is add 360 to that, and when you do, you're going to get an answer of 89. So, your answer is C. Which of the following is not coterminal? So, not coterminal, if you make anything that's not between 0 and 360, between 0 and 360, you'll figure out which one's the odd man out. Okay, these two are both between 0 and 360, so they can, one of those is your answer. So I'm going to take um, 591 and subtract 360, and you are going to find out that that answer is 231, which means these two angles are coterminal, which means that the one that does not is C. Find the radian measure. How do we do that? First of all, don't worry about the negative. It's in every answer. It's carried over. But to go to radians, <coughs> it's pi over 180. Use the fraction bar on your calculator. Um, 34 fraction bar 18 will simplify to 17 over 9. So your answer is going to be C. 90, um, doing the opposite of that. So this time it's going to be 180 over pi. I don't know if you know, if 10 goes into 180 18 times, the pi's cancel. 7 times 18 is 126. Okay? Uh, 91, okay, well, if you know this is 90 and you know that that part is 65, when you add the two of those together, you're going to get 155. Okay, so, moving right along. Find the exact value of sine of negative pi over 6. Okay, that's um, your unit circle. If you don't know that um, by now, punch it in your calculator. It'll be in radians tomorrow or when you take your um, exam. Test mode, um, I think people decided it was better to do it in radians for graphing purposes. Um, cosine of negative 7 pi over 4. Okay. Oops, sorry, it's supposed to be a different color. Negative 7 pi over 4 is square root of, pi over, uh, square root of 2 over 2 because it ends up in the first quadrant. But again, you can put it in your calculator. Um, okay, so looking at these graphs, <clears throat> I need an amplitude of 4 and. Uh, amplitude of 4, so that goes up 4, down 4, yes, do they all, okay, um, the period, I need a period of 2 pi, that means I need a, a whole cycle between 0 and 2 pi, knocks that one out, and that, and that, and that means my answer has to be D, I gotta pause.
Okay, moving on. Uh, 94. That now 95. I have 95. Those are the directions. Okay, so this time I need negative 3 times the sine of 4 theta. So negative 3, remember our sine curve does this. It starts at a 0. So if it's negative, it's going to be going down. That one goes down, that one goes down. That one does not go down, so I'm going to knock that out. Sine of 4 theta, the period is 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. So I should see this between 0 and pi over 2. That one does not, because this right here is pi over 2. That's not, and so the answer has to be B, because we can see that it that is going to be pi over 2, because that's halfway between 0 and pi. 96. Find the domain and period amplitude, and, and if you start with this one, the 6 is your amplitude. And if you go look at the amplitudes, the only one that has that is B. Now, if you want to go for, remember, that negative just tells you it flips. It does not affect the negative, I mean the amplitude. So that's why your amplitude is always a positive number. Um, but all the other information is correct wherever you, I just chose to start with that, and that worked out well. Tangent of negative 5 pi over 6. Negative 5 pi over 6 is down here. Tangent is positive. Again, put it in your calculator if you don't know, or put your unit circle on your note card. Okay. Tangent of negative 2 theta. Well, the tangent of theta does this normally. I missed that zero, but you got the idea. And that's straddle, and this is pi over 2, and negative pi over 2. That's your key point, if you don't remember. Your period here is, um, um, what do you call that? It's pi over 2. So it's actually going to happen further, and that's going to be between pi over 4. So your asymptotes are going to be at plus or minus pi over 4. That There's an asymptote. That doesn't have an asymptote at pi over 4. That one doesn't have one at pi over 4. This one has one at pi over 4, and so does this one. So the difference, we cross these out, okay? Um, the difference between it is that this one has been flipped, because remember this was our graph? Oh, but it's not flipped. So is it B or is it D, pi over 4? Pause. Okay. Um, there is a negative in there, and if you're not sure what that negative does to it, then I would graph it on your calculator. But the effect of is that that negative does come out front, which makes this thing fall. So your answer is going to be B. Again, if you have any questions, you can email me. Um, graph the function. <clears throat> Okay, so this one, I'm going to say that this graph has moved up two units, has an amplitude of two. So this one has not been moved up. That one has been moved up. Um, this one has not been moved up, and that one has. Um, when I look at these, the next thing I'm going to look for is the fact that my um, cosine function starts at a max. This is the, um, the key points that we have look like that. So that one doesn't start at a max, which means that my answer is going to be D. That's what it is on the next page, okay, because that one's starting at a max. All right, so <clears throat> moving right along, let's go to number 100. Um, all right, so this one, my sign has moved, um, it says, well, no, I don't want to put a Y. I was thinking of, come on. Help me out here. Uh, this is moved up two units. Amplitude is still two. So that has moved down, and that has moved down. And if I've moved up, um, and that two right there affects my period. My period is two pi over two, which is pi. So that means between zero and pi, I have to have a whole um, period. This function has a period of pi. This one does not have a period of pi. That has a period of 2 pi. So I'm going to go with A. You are looking to choose the best answer, which um, I want to go back to this. Even though it does look like it may have been shifted left instead of right, it is the better choice of the other two, but I will make sure that won't be an issue on the exam. Okay, 101. Let's go with 
which one's been translated up up means it's outside the parentheses so those are knocked out and you do the same thing when it's on the outside so 101 is d um, right is on the inside so knock out those that are outside and if i go to the right on the inside we do the opposite of what it looks like so 102 is b 103 all right um you probably ought to put that in your calculator uh, well okay um secant you do need to know that that's one over the cosine so you can do one divided by the cosine of negative 270 degrees or you can type in the cosine of 270 degrees and then take one over it either way or you can know where it is but the point is the answer is a okay uh, evaluate the cosecant of pi over 2 okay pi over 2 is up here those points are 0 1 cosecant is 1 over the sine and 1 over the sine of 1 is 1 so 104 is B cotangent same thing we just did cotangent is 1 over the tangent so in your calculator you would put it like this or evaluate it and then take the inverse of it but regardless the answer is B um, simplify the trig function secant is 1 over the cosine cosine is cosine over 1 and that simplifies to 1 use a calculator to find so when you do that make sure you're in radians okay um, if you don't get any of these answers that should be a clue that you're not in radians okay so the sign of uh, inverse sign and when you did that on your calculator you should have gotten a number of negative 1.06 okay now it's one of these two you got the 2 pi n down but 1.06 remember when we talked about this this is of course 0 this is pi which is 3.14 okay and this is half of pi which is 1.57 so 1.06 is you know somewhere in here in the first quadrant the sign is not negative so that cannot be the answer and your answer has to be D okay um, inverse tangent when you put that in your calculator you get an answer of 1.27 so obviously that's not it and that and the tangent has the period of pi so your answer is B there and that gives you all of your possible tangent values all right 109 what value satisfies the equation <clears throat> we did have these problems on a test where all of these you could put it in the calculator and figure out what it is a little bit harder with your radian values okay um, you do want to get this one you're going to get the tangents together so if I add a tangent I'm going to have 6 tangent of theta equals 6 divide both sides by 6 tangent equals 1 where is the tangent equal to 1 at pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4 so the answer is D um, this one I'm <coughs> excuse me I'm going to factor out a cosine cosine of theta is 1 minus tangent of theta and so I set each of those equal to 0 1 minus tangent equals 0 so 1 equals the tangent of theta so where's the cosine 0 that's up and down which is pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 where's the tangent equal to 1 that is what we just figured out I think which was pi over 4 and 5 pi over 4 so you think it's all four answers and you go and you don't have these answers in there <clears throat> and the reason you don't have those answers is because the tangent is sine over cosine and you can't have cosine equal to zero because that would make the function undefined so the only answers you have are C or is C or five whatever you got the idea all right tangent I'm gonna do these down here because they take up a little bit more room tangent squared of theta equals negative three halves um, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that fraction so I'm gonna multiply both sides by two <coughs> excuse me 2 tangent squared theta equals negative 3 times the secant of theta okay so tangent of theta 
tangent squared is the same thing as secant squared theta minus 1 from your trig identities. And so we have 2 secant squared theta minus 2 equals negative 3 times the secant of theta. And now it is quadratic-like, so we bring everything to one side. So I have 2 secant squared theta plus 3 secant theta minus 2. And I'm going to factor. The only way to factor this 2 secant... I didn't mean to do that. 2 secant squared is 2 secant and secant. And then I have the 2, because remember these two give me the first. These two give me the last. The only way to factor 2 is 2 and 1, so you just had to work it out till you figured out which one it needed to be. So when I set those equal to 0, I have the secant of theta. Oh, I'll write it out in case people... Oh dear. I gotta stop. Uh, let me look real quick. Is it... It is. I gotta stop. So I'll be back to finish, hopefully. Okay, so let's finish this problem up. Um, 2 secant theta minus 1 times secant theta plus 2. Set each factor equal to 0. Uh, minus 1 equals 0. Secant of theta plus 2 equals 0. So y'all are pretty good. This is secant of theta. Take the 1 over and divide by 2 gives me 1 half secant of theta equals negative 2. So when you have secant, which is not one of our main three, sine, cosine, tangent, if it's not one of those main three, then you take the reciprocal of both sides. So cosine, the reciprocal of the secant is the cosine, the reciprocal of 2 is, I mean, excuse me, the reciprocal of 1 half is 2. The reciprocal of the secant, again, is cosine, the reciprocal of negative 2 is negative 1 half. Well, can the cosine ever be 2? No, won't happen. Where is the cosine negative 1 half? Cosine is negative 1 half here and here, which is at 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So the answer is D. Okay, number 12, 112. 2, um, you're looking here, there's a common factor. So I'm going to factor out the cosine of theta. And I'm left with 2 times the sine of theta plus 1. And that gives me, oh, I'm going to set each factor equal to 0. Cosine of theta equals 0. 2 times the sine of theta plus 1 equals 0, which is similar to what we just did. So that means the sine of theta equals negative 1 half. So where's the cosine 0? That's at the top and the bottom. So theta equals pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Now you can look at those and see that doesn't have both of them. This one does. So it's one of those three. Where's the sine negative 1 half? Sine is negative 1 half here and here. And that means that's 5. Nope, that's not 5. 5 pi over 6 is in this quadrant. So it's 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6, which means my answer is B. All right, 113, I think we're on the home stretch. Oh, golly. All right, so standard position angle, determine the point x, y. Okay, for the point 9, 12, find the cosecant and the secant. Um, you can draw your triangle. X, this is x, this is y. Um, I'm going to do um, x squared plus y squared equals r squared because I think that's the easiest. Um, and so that means that 81 plus 144 is r squared. So r squared is 225. And r is 15. Plus or minus 15, but r is always positive. Okay, cosecant is 1 over the sine. Secant is 1 over the cosine. Our ordered pairs go cosine and sine. <clears throat> so, um, and I feel like I need to draw a triangle because y'all are going to want it. If I draw my triangle, okay, I got 9, 12, which is going to be like right here. 
That's really bad, but you got the idea. 9. This is 9. This is 12. Because that's the x. That's the y. This is my theta. If you do it this way, you have to draw the triangle down to the x-axis. Okay? But that's your theta. And your sine would be, and we found this was 15 because that's my r. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. That means that the cosecant is hypotenuse over the opposite, or r over y. So which one of those has cosecant is 15 over 12? Cosecant 15 over 12, this one does not, and this one does not. Okay, the secant is um, 1 over the cosine. Cosine is 9 over 15, so I want 15 over 9, which of course means that A is my answer. Yeah, I wasn't going to do the triangle, and then I thought a lot of people probably never remembered the X, Y, R thing, so that's why I went back to the triangle. Sorry about that. Okay, <clears throat> same kind of thing for number 114. Okay, um, you do X squared plus Y squared equals R squared, or let's go draw it, 4, 3. So if I go 4, 3, here's my triangle. Really bad one there. I'm probably going to take out the whole thing. Poo. All right. So this is 4, this is 3, this is theta. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, so that's 5. 3, 4, 5. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so tangent's 3 over 4. 3 over 4, 3 over 4. Oh, good. We get to move on. Find the height of the triangle. It is a right triangle. Because it's a right triangle, I can use Sakatoa. Okay? And that means that this is opposite of my angle of 61, and this is the hypotenuse, which means that it's the sine. So the sine of 61 equals opposite over hypotenuse. And when I put that in my calculator, if I'm looking for the variable on top, that means that I solve it by multiplying. So 95 times the sine of 61 equals x, and that gives you 83 0.1, so the answer is A. All right, so here I tell you to use the law of sines. And our law, law of sines says the sine of A over A equals the sine of B over B equals the sine of C over C. So if I filled this in, I would have the sine of 38 over 31 equals the sine of 74 over measure of angle B. That's what I'm looking for. So we cross multiply. B times the sine of 38 equals 31 times the sine of 74. And I always put that number in front because if you don't close your calculator correctly, then it'll mess up your value. And then, of course, we divide by the sine of 38. So 31 times the sine of 74 over the sine of 38. Okay, again, worthwhile to put it in your calculator to make sure that you can get the correct answer, which is D48.4. All right, we are, is this the last page? Whew, party. Okay, 117. Um, again, I have a right triangle, and so since I have a right triangle, I can use Sakatoa. And this time, what's the measure of the angle? Well, this is adjacent to the angle, and this is the hypotenuse of the angle. So the cosine of x, because adjacent hypotenuse cosine, is 58.3 over 93.6. So in your calculator, x equals the inverse cosine of 58.3 over 93.6, and when you put that in, I believe you get an answer of 51.5 degrees. Okay, now, what is the area? What's our formula for area? It is one half AB times the sine of C, and maybe I shouldn't put area, it might confuse some people, but this is area formula, okay, not angle A. So you should have one half A which, which is, okay, it's the two sides that include the angle. That's what this formula is. So that means it's 1 half 20 times 20 times the sine of 25 degrees. 
make sure your calculator is in degrees. Okay, so a clue would be maybe that the answer is not there if you did try to put it in, but it is 84.5. Again, another one worthwhile. Put your calculator in and make sure you get that, that you know how to put this in your calculator. Okay, 119. Use the law of cosines. So if I'm looking for the law of cosines, uh, I'm using, and I'm trying to find J, but I don't know side J, but I'm going to be using, um, I'll try to do it here, J squared equals K squared plus L squared minus 2KL cosine of J. Oh, do I know J? Oh, I do know J. Okay, but I'm looking for angle J, so that works. So J squared is 12 squared equals 9 squared plus 9.75 squared minus 2 times 9 times 9.75 times the cosine of j. Now we've talked about this lots. These two, I got to take them to the other side and I don't pick up my calculator till the end. So 12 squared minus 9 squared minus 9.75 squared equals negative 2 I'm going to run out of room. Negative 2 times 9 times 9.75 times the cosine of j. So what ends up happening is the cosine of j, again, worthwhile to put it in your calculator to make sure you know how to do it. This is what's on top. And I encourage you to put it all in one fell swoop. And this is on the bottom. And when you, when you put that in, you're going to get a number 1827, 0.1827. So J equals the inverse cosine of 0.1827. Whenever you're looking for the angle, you want to use the inverse, the negative one sign. And that gives me an angle of D. One of the things that you can point out, y'all, the largest angle is opposite the longest side. So um, think about some of those choices if it uh, comes down to it. Okay, last problem. All right, so in triangle G, F, G, H, we have G equals H equals the measure of angle F, and they want me to find the measure of angle G. Okay, um, I can't find G. I can't use the law of sines first because I don't have a pair. I don't have, a, I don't have big G, I don't have big H, or I don't have little F. But I do have the angle, so I can find F by using my law of cosines, g squared plus h squared minus 2gh cosine of, I think I'm on right, 72, f. So f squared equals 8 squared plus 13 squared minus 2 times 8 times 13 times the cosine of 72. Now when you put that in, you're going to have F squared. Remember, it's squared is 168.724. So F equals 12.9894. Now, I'm still trying to find measure of angle G. So now I can use my law of sines. The sine of G over little g equals the sine of F over little f. If it says round to the nearest tenth, you got to make sure to go out. I'm going to just go 989. You can never go out too far uh, if you wait till the end of round. Okay, so to solve that, I'm going to multiply by 8. So the sine of g equals 8 times the sine of 72 over 12.989. And if you divide that out, you're looking for g, so you're going to use the inverse sign button and that decimal that you should have gotten is 5857 and that angle is 35.9 degrees so there's your study guide an hour and 24 minutes later if you have any questions about how to use your calculator or anything either come see me before school or email me thank you and i really do hope everybody does very well on the exam